morning. I rejoice with those who said, let us go to the house of the Lord. May our hearts be filled with joy on this day as we gather and worship and praise, gathering around the means of grace and being reminded of what God's love for us is about expressed in the redeeming work of Jesus. Uh, Last week we had the opportunity to gather around and be reminded how Jesus really keeps it simple, right? Uh, speaks very plainly, and that theme kind of continues on again today as we are reminded with the Apostle Paul, uh, we we preach Christ crucified. We're not ashamed of the cross. We don't hide the cross. We're tempted sometimes. We're going to talk about that a little bit in our sermon time. The uh, opportunity to gather together and join our hearts in worship and praise is a blessing that God grants to us. And we're thankful for this time as we're reminded how Jesus rescues us from sin and helps us. So um, he rescued us from the law of God, which we'll review the first three in the Old Testament lesson. Have no other gods. Don't misuse God's name. Right? Remember the Sabbath day. Those are summarized. Love God. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. That's God's law. How well are we doing with that? Well, we know Jesus rescued us, right? And for that, we're so thankful. We'll be following the common service with Holy Communion. Again, here at Our Saviors, we do practice what is known as that close or fellowship communion. Uh, to our visitors and guests worshiping with us. We're very thankful, very happy you could join us. Uh, we do ask that you, if you are a member of a Wells or ELS church, you're welcome to come forward. If you are uh, belonging to a different church, uh, that you respect our practice of this close fellowship. And as I say that, I always highlight and remind everyone, please know we're not judging anyone. We're not. It's, we have this because we can't judge. We can't judge the heart. You know, if I could look into everyone and say, yeah, okay, yeah, you got faith, you're good to go, you're good to go, you know it, and I had that ability, then we wouldn't have to worry about these practices. But I'm not God. I don't judge. We have to go with the outward confession. So that's the reason for that practice. In no way is it exclusion, elitism, or anything else. So uh, please, please take it as we intend to give glory and honor to God, to be respect his command that if we receive it the wrong way, we're, we're guilty of sinning against the body and blood of Christ. I don't want to be an accomplice to that sin, so we follow through in this practice. So that, that's the reason for that. It is not in any way an exclusion or a judgment, so I pray you understand that and be more than happy to visit with you more about that after our worship service today if you have questions. So those are our opening announcements. We are ready to join our hearts and voices in worship and praise to our gracious God. We turn to page two in our service folder. We begin then with that invocation. God promises to be with us when we call on his name. He's made himself known to us in this way. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, we draw near with a true heart. We confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us.
God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us. He's given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We pray. Almighty God, look with favor on your humble servants and stretch out the right hand of your power to defend us against all our enemies. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We turn our attention now to our Scripture readings for This third Sunday in the season of Lent, our first reading is the Old Testament lesson from Exodus. We read from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 7. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from the land of Egypt where you were slaves. You shall have no other gods beside me. You shall not make any carved images for yourself or a likeness of anything in heaven above, or on the earth below, or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow down to them, or be subservient to them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. I follow up on the guilt of the fathers with their children, their grandchildren, and their great-great-grandchildren, if they also hate me. But I show mercy to thousands who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not permit anyone who misuses his name to escape unpunished. Here ends the Old Testament lesson. We turn to our psalm this day at Psalm 19. We join in singing that psalm in unison this morning. Lord, you have the words of everlasting life. Lord, you have the words of everlasting life. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. Lord, you have the words of everlasting life. The law of the Lord is perfect, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. They are more precious than gold. They are sweeter than honey. By them is your servant taught. In keeping them there is great reward. Lord, you have the words of everlasting life. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my Redeemer. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Lord, you have the words of everlasting life. Our second reading today is the sermon text for today. Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, reading verses 22 to 25. Yes. Jews ask for signs. Greeks desire wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, 
which is offensive to Jews and foolishness to Greeks. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. We preach Christ crucified because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Here ends our epistle lesson. Verse of the day taken from John 3. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in Him may have eternal life. Amen. Turn our attention now to our gospel reading. For those that are able, we invite you to please stand for our gospel lesson today. Dear friends, we stand in respect to the Holy Gospel our Lord gives us through the Gospel writer John, reading in the second chapter beginning at the 13th verse. Glory be to you, O Lord. This is where we see how the Old Testament lesson and the Gospel reading kind of bookend and connect. In the Old Testament lesson, the introduction to those commands, that demand. God's it. God's number one. And how we focus in on that, how we, how we express that and show that in our lives is uh, in our worship, right? In our, in our lives. In the Gospel reading, we hear of the time when Jesus does show up to the temple and zeal, right? Zeal for His Father, zeal for His God in heaven above overtakes Him that He kind of goes out of character here a little bit, right? He chases the money changers, those that are taking advantage of a location for their own good. There's nothing wrong in supporting and encouraging each other in our worship to God, but that's not what was going on here. They, they were setting up their vendor tables for their own personal gain and advantage. And their hearts were so far from God. Jesus understood and knew that, and so he reacts in a way that is out of character, that almost might seem kind of harsh, but it's not, because the focus and the commitment was to his heavenly Father. We read from John chapter 2. The Jewish Passover was near, so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and money changers sitting at tables. He made a whip of cords and drove everyone out of the temple courts, along with the sheep and the oxen. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those selling doves, he said, Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews responded, What sign are you going to show us to prove you can do these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up again. The Jews said, it took 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. When Jesus was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. Then they believed the scripture and what Jesus had said. Here ends our gospel reading. Praise be to you, O Christ. We continue now by making confession of our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed on page 9. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, Through Him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, He rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and His kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, 
who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and a life for the world to come. Amen. Congregation, you may be seated. song called Our Savior Jesus. He saves us from all sin. My Father in heaven has made the law with our Lord Jesus we stand in awe for he suffered and he died for our souls God sees us blameless, that was his goal. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That is required for us to be free. Free from idols made by man. Through Jesus' love. takes away all of our guilt. We now belong to the house that God built. May we cling to God above. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, dear friends. The word of our Lord upon which we're basing our meditation today are those verses from the epistle lesson on this third Sunday in the season of Advent, which draws to the focus of how, in our worship theme, Jesus rescues us from the law. Because the law is pretty exact. When we read those verses from Exodus 20 today, It's pretty straightforward and it's pretty strong, right? You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not permit anyone who misuses His name to escape unpunished. We understand what that means, right? If at any time we took God's name, we called on Jesus but not because we were praying to Him, praising Him, or worshiping Him, but maybe we missed the nail and hit our thumbnail and said and announced Jesus' name? That's misusing it. And it's pretty clear right there. You misuse it, you're not permitted to be before God. Or you back up. You shall have no other gods besides Me. You shall not take any carved images, for yourself or a likeness of anything in heaven above or on the earth below or waters or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow down to them. Do not be subservient to them. Don't let them become more important in God or even more important in yourself. Now, we might not have the wooden carved images, but we have a lot of things of wood of stone, of metal, yeah, even maybe that plastic in our wallets or purses that become 
more important than God and that we become subjective to, right? What does that tell us? Just in those first two commandments, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. But it's for that very reason that we come now to these words of the epistle lesson and review and remind ourselves and be encouraged of this necessary point. This is necessary. This isn't just something that's kind of unique and makes us special as a Christian congregation. Friends, this is vital. This is the bedrock. This is the foundation. And that's what Paul was highlighting again in these words. Now, we might be all sitting there going, well, yeah, of course. But we also know, I feel, and are quite aware that the concept, the idea of this cross whether it's this cross hanging around my neck, whether it's the cross that's lit up in the altar area, whether it's the cross on the baptismal font, the cross hanging around maybe your neck or a special place in your home, that this world is really beginning to take more and more issue with that, right? I saw it this week. Kind of one of those social media things where they take a good old-fashioned cartoon and they update it. You know, those good, fun, healthy ones from, I think it's called Family Circle, right? And the dad is talking, I think it's Little Billy, you know, and it's, you know, okay. He's trying to teach him. How do you get something you want for? What do you say? Now, of course, the normal, the old cartoon was thank you or please. But they updated it. And so out of Billy's mouth comes a little air bubble with the words, I'm offended. (laughs) Right? That's what our society is doing today, right? And there are those that are offended by the cross. Even to the point that we see it in a lot of what is referred to nowadays as those mega churches, those non-denominational churches, that when you actually look at their worship area, there is no cross. Now, in their conviction, in their statement of belief, they say they believe in Jesus Christ. They believe that His suffering and death is what forgives their sins. But when you actually look at their mission statement, when you look at their, 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 their focus and what some of their most hit on and popular sermons are, I'll come back to self-help and how you feel good about yourself. There really isn't talk about what Paul mentions here today and what we are reminded of. We preach Christ crucified. Why? Because it's the truth. And as Paul reminds us in these words, because it is what represents complete wisdom and complete power, though the world doesn't see it that way. Let's listen again to those verses, and let's take a moment to focus in on why we preach Christ crucified. Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, as he began this letter to the Corinthians, this is in the first chapter, And the first chapter of his first letter to those young Christians, not young by age, but young Christians in Corinth, starts off with this comparison of what foolishness looks like and what wisdom and power looks like. Yes, Jews ask for signs. Greeks desire wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, which is offensive to Jews and foolishness to Greeks. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. We preach Christ crucified because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. How true. 
Things haven't changed. Right? Paul, Paul's words here when he talks about offensiveness and foolishness, those are the same objections that are raised today when we evangelize, when we witness the love of Jesus and we talk about what He accomplished on that cross. That when we're out there sharing this Gospel truth, there are people that laugh and scoff and say, this is crazy. This is ridiculous. Or, okay, prove it. And and, and Paul segments segments the, 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 the two makeups of the congregation in Corinth, which was in every early Christian church and which contains still today in our world, in society. This is a universal message. We need to remind ourselves, we need to make sure we recognize the importance of preaching Christ crucified. Why? Because to the world, it's offensive. It's foolishness. And it sounds utter failure and weakness, which it is not, of course. Paul said the the Jews find it offensive. And what do they want? Well, what they were seeking throughout history and time, right? Let's go to the Gospel reading for a minute. What a scene. Kind, humble, quiet Jesus who would just kind of come in and talk to people and have that, you know, perfect, holy, gentle smile as He took children in His arms and blessed them. As He calmed His disciples down. As He disarmed the critics and the enemies that came at Him with venom in their mouth and He just smiled. All of a sudden on this day, he goes nuts. Grabs a rope, twists it together, and starts swinging around and chasing the animals out. Grabs tables, tips them over, money's flying all over the place. How dare you make my father's house a place of business, he says. You know what the Jews did? Did you pick up on what the Jews did? They didn't defend themselves. They didn't say, no, 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 that's not what we're doing. No. What do they do? They say, hey, by what sign? Give us some miracles to back up what you're doing here. They don't don't question. They they don't try and defend and say, hey, in, in, in this passage it said God will allow to make it easy for the people to do their sacrifices that we can set this up. They had nothing scripturally to defend this practice and they didn't try to defend it they just wanted Jesus to prove by some awesome sign a great miracle that he had the authority to do this that that was like their natural go-to do we understand why that's been one of the blessings of taking the time on Sunday mornings to be growing in the word in our growing in the word Bible study reviewing through these Old Testament Bible history lessons and being reminded how God made His presence known to His people. The Jewish people grew up hearing these incredible stories of how Moses was able to take a a stick and lay it on the ground and it turned into a snake. How he was able to take that same staff and touch the waters of the mighty Nile and it turned to blood. How in helping the people escape, the waters parted and they passed on dry ground, not mucky, muddy water. and It was dry. How during that time they were fed by heavenly bread manna. Quail flying into the camp. Easy catch. Water coming out of a rock. They grew up. Their history was hearing how God's mighty power was shown and how God took care of them. This was in their genetics. This was in their way. They looked for signs. They wanted signs. But their eyes had become blind. Jesus was doing miracles. 
He didn't come to be the miracle worker. He came to be the Savior of the world. But He was doing miracles. He was showing His divine power, His divine nature in wonderful ways. And the people were talking about it. I mean, there were people that had been blind. Their eyes hadn't worked. And Jesus opened them up and they could see perfectly. People that hadn't been able to hear their whole life for, for years, all of a sudden they could hear everything, even that pin drop. Because their hearing was now perfect. Because Jesus had healed them. People whose legs had never ever worked before, on that day, or jump up and walk and run and leap without any physical therapy and rehabilitation, but immediately there's perfect muscle tone, stability and balance because Jesus' divine nature shows He can do that. And we can go on and on and on. He was doing miracles. But that's not why He came. And the problem with the Jews is that those aren't the kind of miracles they wanted. They wanted some of those Old Testament miracles. They, they, they had explained and prepared and taught themselves and their children that when the Messiah comes, He's going to restore Israel. They needed Jesus to gather together this powerful army and conquer Rome and take back their land and put them all back in charge and, and show that dominance and power. Then He's the Messiah they want. That's the sign they were looking for. They wanted that kind of power. That's not what Jesus came for. He came to rescue them and us from the law. And the only way, the only way that could be accomplished in accord with God's plan of salvation was that payment had to be exacted for those sins. And the payment had to be a perfect sacrifice that would count for all people for all times. That was God's plan. That's why Jesus came. And that's what Jesus accomplished. And Paul was guided by the Holy Spirit to remind those Christians in Corinth and us also today that that's what this is about. For that's true power. But they wanted more. fall into that trap too sometimes, don't we? I know Jesus is my Savior. I know what that cross symbolizes and represents. And my heart aches at times knowing my sin, my rebellion, put Him up on that cross. But there's also times in trusting and knowing Jesus and that He is Almighty God that I could really use His help with this and this and this. I, I know He died on the cross and I know He's God and I know He tells me He loves me, but I need a little bit of sign. I need a little bit of help. I need a little proof of that love right now in my life because my life isn't going the way I want it to. Isn't He God? Isn't He all-powerful? Doesn't He say He'll listen to my prayers? Why isn't He helping me? See how quickly we can slide into sitting there and falling in just like the Jews and demanding signs? Jesus, if you really want me to trust you and believe in you, you need to do these things for me. We preach Christ crucified. We proclaim the simple, powerful, incredible truth. He gave His life for us when we were still enemies of Him. Separated by God because of our sin and in love He came and gave His life for us. There is no greater sign of love, of power and strength than that. 
Oh, but there's Satan pushing us sometimes. Come on. Ask him. Demand it. He says you can ask anything you want in his name. He'll give it to you. Push it. Demand it. Threaten him. Right? That, that, that's the old Adam. That's the sinful nature. That's Satan whispering in our ears, trying to demand the very same wisdom and power and proof that the Jews and the Gentiles wanted. Friends, I've been there. Even in ministry, I've been there. Wallowing in my own pity, self-pity, and saying, Lord, come on. Why are you letting these mega churches, these non-denominational churches, seem to be so successful and the people are just running to be in their doors and they're, they're not even teaching the right thing? And, and I'm sitting there going, where are all the people at? Not, not now. I'm talking back in Wyoming. I had those days early on in ministry up in Calgary, Alberta. I never struggled with it in South Dakota where I began my ministry because I was in a town of 300 people with seven churches. <laughs> but in Calgary, my early ministry, I did. I, I, I was like the Jews. I demanded signs. Come on, God. I'm being faithful. I'm preaching. Let's make this work. Plus, I needed to get the home mission board off my back because they wanted to see numbers. Right? It's, it's, it's foolishness. It's our foolishness. And that, that's what Paul's talking about today. These words are talking to you and me. Of course we preach Christ crucified. But let's recognize how our own sinful nature puts us into these same categories of the Jews who demand signs or of the Greeks who look for wisdom. Because there's nothing wise or intelligent or logical about this. How in the world can a man who supposedly was born from a young woman who was a virgin, yeah, right, who, who lived a perfect life 2,000 years ago, who was deceived, betrayed, and nailed to a cross, come on, how can that save me? I hear the words. i got to keep God number one. I've got to use His name the right way. I've got to honor the Sabbath day. I need to respect my parents and all those in authority over me. I need to respect the gift of life. I need to respect the gift of marriage. I need to respect my neighbor. I can't speak ill or gossip or lie. I've got to do all these things right. I've got to prove myself. I've got to prove how good I am. I've got to work my way. It's up to me. It ain't up to Jesus. He showed me the way, but it's up to me, right? That's logical. But that's why we celebrate and preach Christ crucified because just as I go through that quick list, just even this week, I'm already thinking, ding, 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 ding of ways I didn't keep those laws. And all it takes is one ding and we're disqualified. Because God is holy and perfect. That's what He demands. I can't do that on my own. Never, ever. So it's not logical. And it doesn't necessarily connect with Human wisdom that, well, if you smarter and gain more education and gain more wisdom and, and, and grab on these things, then you won't be burdened and controlled by an institution or by a book that was written by men thousands of years ago that which academic society says is foolishness and gullibleness. But we come back to, we preach Christ crucified. Because... The foolishness of God is wiser than any man. And that is foolish. It's foolish that God loved us so much He was willing to give us a part of Him as one and only Son. 
It was foolishness that Jesus was willing to leave His throne of power, of omnipotence, of all-knowingness, of everything that was His and humble Himself and live here on this earth for those years and endure and put up with the type of treatment that He did. But that's the awesomeness of His love and He did it for us. And though the world might mock it, We preach it. We preach it because it's the truth. We preach it and proclaim it because this is what happened. God gave a promise in the garden when our first parents messed up. God kept that promise and Jesus came and He died on that cross to crush the serpent's head, to destroy the sting of death, to pay the price for all our sins, And we hold to that truth and so we continue to preach Christ crucified. And we'll hold to that truth until the Lord welcomes us home to heaven. And we live in a world that might mock it and scoff it and be offended by it. But we're still going to preach it. And we're going to still live by it. Because it is the only way. And it is the wisdom of God and the true power of God. That gives us life every day. To God be the glory. And may we rejoice in that cross every day. Amen. May that peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard and keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Continue on page 11 in our worship service with that verse. Create me a clean heart, O God. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from Your presence, and take not Your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your free spirit. Amen. For those that have offerings of love and thanks, just a reminder, the offering plates are in the back on the stands by the door. You're welcome to place your offerings there either as you came in or as you depart today. We go to our Lord with the prayer of the church and join in the Lord's Prayer. Lord Jesus, You are the author and perfecter of our faith. Obeying Your Father's will, You endured the cross and scorned its shame. But we find comfort knowing that today You sit at the right hand of that throne of God governing all things in wisdom, truth, and power. Lord, we confess that it was for us and for our salvation that You came to this world to suffer and die. We know You bore our guilt. You endured our punishment. You experienced the wrath of God in our place. For Your unselfish sacrifice on our behalf, help us to show our gratitude to You in everything we think say, and do. As we walk through life, keep us from becoming entangled by sin. Take away those obstacles and stumbling blocks and keep us from falling or going astray. Help us to run with perseverance the race that You have marked out for us. And when that way involves pain, suffering, disappointment, trials, persecution, help us view these things as evidence of Your loving discipline intended to draw us even closer to You. Thank You for the message of the cross. Thank You that that message is based on truth, power, wisdom, and above all, love. May we cherish it. May we trust it. May we share it in all we say and do. Hear us, Lord, as we take a moment to bring you our own personal, private petitions.
And Lord, hold before us the example of those who have gone before, bearing the cross for you. As you led them, so lead us. As you strengthen them, so strengthen us. Keep our eyes fixed on you, for then we shall surely arise safely at our heavenly home, that home that you have prepared for us. Hear us for your mercy's sake as we join in that prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Continue with our liturgy on page 12. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is true and right so to do. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by His death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil who overcame us by a tree would in turn by a tree be overcome. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of heavenly hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he. Blessed is He, blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the true faith and a life everlasting. Go in peace. Your sins are forgiven you. Amen. We now continue with the note to minister. Lord, now you let your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people. A light to light in the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. O give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, and His mercy endures forever. We give thanks, Almighty God, that You have refreshed us with this Holy Supper. We pray that through it You will strengthen our faith in You and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with You and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Receive with believing hearts that blessing from our God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. 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 We close our service with a favorite hymn of many, I would guess. Him 411. What a friend we have in Jesus. (laughs) 
What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Oh, because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? Come, but with a load of care. Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Who your friends despise, forsake you. Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield you. You will find a solace there.